Well, good morning, church. Let's stand and worship. This is the day our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Sing, I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to them, hasten so glad and free. sin and strife. He is the true one. He is the just one. He has the words of God. I will hasten. I will hasten to him. Hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest highest, I will come to Now it is? All right. Well, good morning. You probably didn't hear me say that, did you? I'm glad you're here. Glad to be here with you. I bet you're glad I'm here. Well, you might have mixed feelings about that, but it's good, good to be together, as always, on the Lord's Day as the Lord's people. We offer a special greeting to those who are visiting with us. We welcome you in the love of Jesus and glad that you're here and hope that you're blessed by being here today. If today's your first time, Hopefully somebody uh, greeted you out front and offered you a little gift bag as an expression of our thanks for your attendance here today. And also a bag with some information about our church in it that may be of interest to you. And uh, a little card that you could fill out and leave with us to let us know that you were here. And if there's any way that we can follow up with you, um, pray for you or be of service in any way. And so if they didn't catch you coming in, you try to catch them on the way out. We'd love to know you were here. And, uh, and even if we... Don't we hope that you are blessed by having been here today. I want to make a few announcements as we get started today. I'll remind you, we've got this uh, Lifeline um, Adopt a Bottle initiative going on for Lifeline Pregnancy Center. I'm thankful to say all the bottles have been claimed. So thank you for that. And praise the Lord for that. But we do want them back. You know, that's part of the project. And uh, so um, return those by Father's Day on uh, Sunday, Father's Day. That's a couple of weeks out, and so um, thank you for your participation in that. I want to remind you, too, that today, uh, this afternoon, there is a young family pool day at Dr. Luke's pool, 
And then starting on Thursday, this Thursday and, and throughout June and July, there will be um, some uh, gatherings for moms um, at Dr. Luke's pool on, on Thursdays as well. And so hopefully, uh, including those who have been part of the Bible study this spring that moms have been doing, but also some others that would be added to that. That's a special calendar event coming up throughout the course of June and July. This Wednesday, we are resuming our table gatherings here at the church. And so an email went out this morning for you to RSVP if you plan to attend. Please do that so that we know how to plan, um, not only this week, but throughout June and July. And for June and July, we have missionaries that will be sharing each week. And you know how special that is. Every time we have occasion to do that, we did something similar last summer. So we'll have missionaries speaking each week, beginning this Wednesday. And uh, for this first one, at 5.30 will be a, a hymn sing. We're singing songs together at 5.30, and then dinner um, begins at 6. But this week, in particular, there will be some hymns featured there for those who are interested in that. And um, also, just wanted to update you on our Mission Sunday. A couple of weeks ago, we um, announced this special um, initiative that we have we're raising money for this uh, discipleship center, a ministry center in um, Central Asia with some of our workers that we support there who um, happen to be here. I don't know how um, conspicuous I ever am supposed to be in uh, occasions like this, but um, I'll let them make themselves conspicuous later if they want to be. But the, uh, we have a $15,000 goal. So far, we've raised $6,500 of that. And so thank the Lord for that. Thank you for your um, faithfulness in that. And thanks for uh, continuing to contribute as we uh, seek to reach that goal. This morning we have a uh, special service, a really exceptionally special service in store, I suppose. Uh, the sermon text is from Ephesians 2. Um, actually, 8 through 10, we'll read 1 through 10 again. That's not what's exceptionally special about it. But that is the sermon passage, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, if you wanted to mark your place there ahead of time. I'll also remind you just as a part of our worship, we're, we don't pass collection plates, but we do have offering boxes um, in the back as you're exiting or down front here for those who want to know um, where those are and how to make your offering. And then um, at the conclusion of the service or, or as the service winds down, you see um, we'll be receiving communion together. As always, we want to be preparing our hearts uh, to receive the sacrament rightly. But the maybe extraordinarily special part of that is to have the service bookended by both of the sacraments. And so as we look to conclude the service with uh, communion, we'll begin it with the sacrament of baptism. And so I'm going to invite Robert and Hannah Tapia del Valle to come forward. They're bringing their daughter, Lydia Claire, for baptism today. And I'll invite um, Harrison Brooks to come forward too. There's Harrison. I knew I saw him earlier. And uh, Harrison and his wife, Caroline, are playing a special role in the life of this little baby. Um, we in the Presbyterian Church don't have uh, godparents per se, but recognize in the special role very often that some uh, couple or individuals are asked to play in the life of, of the child. Harrison and Caroline are those people. And um, from what I know, I think they chose well. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Caroline was sick today and unable to be here, um, but we're thankful they're a part of this service. And um, a part of the life of this little baby. Well, baptism is a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. It symbolizes actually a number of things. A believer's engrafting into Christ uh, symbolizes rebirth, remission of sins, of the believer's yielding to God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life. And it is by baptism that a person makes entry into the visible covenant community of faith. Not only adult believers, but also their children. And I know that's unfamiliar territory to 
many and probably in any evangelical circles. So I want to explain for just a few minutes, if you'll oblige me, um, what it is we're doing and why we do it. So we see throughout the Bible that God reveals his intention to continue his covenant with his people through families. God said to Abraham in Genesis 17, when he first established his covenant, when he first began to set apart a people for himself, he said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. It revealed God's intention to work through generations of families. An intention which is reiterated at other places in the Bible, including he reiterated it to Moses in the book of Deuteronomy as they got ready to enter the promised land and God gave them commandments that they were to follow as, as their uh, sort of framework for how to live in the land as the people of God. And he said uh, they were to live that way and they were to teach their children and their children's children to do so also, that his covenant might be established on the earth. It's reiterated also in Psalm 78. At the beginning of Psalm 78, it's just recounting the history uh, briefly of the faithfulness and unfaithfulness of the people of God at different times um, up through the life of David. And he says that he gave commandments to their fathers to teach to their children who were to teach also to their children, a generation yet unborn. That is, God has planned, intended, designed from the outset to establish a covenant with mankind and to continue that covenant through families, generation after generation. And God gave Abraham a visible sign of that covenant to be administered to him and to his children. And it would be important to say the sign even then did not save, but it indicated God's promise to apply the benefits of his covenant to those who would believe in him. In the Old Testament, that covenant sign was circumcision, indicating that God's people were under a covenant that would involve the shedding of blood to purify them. But after the blood of Christ was shed once for all, the sign of the covenant was changed to water baptism to show how Christ shed blood washes away sin for those who put their faith in him. And that's why on the day of Pentecost, many of you remember, after the resurrection of Jesus, when asked by the crowd what they needed to do to be saved, Peter told them, repent and not be circumcised again, but repent and be baptized. And then he said, for the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. We see repeatedly in the New Testament that entire households were baptized as they themselves recognized God's covenant plan. So just as under the old covenant, the covenant sign of circumcision was applied to the children of the household of faith, so... Baptism, as the sign of the new covenant, is administered to children as well. And like circumcision, again, we should say, baptism does not save anyone. But it's a visible sign of God's pledge to save those who put their faith in him. So as Robert and Hannah dedicate Lydia to God today, they also pray that God would work graciously in her heart to bring Lydia to a knowledge of him and what he has done, even from a very young age, that she too would put her faith in Jesus Christ with God's pledge that when that faith is given, his promise is to save. And so we might, as the congregation, be reminded on this occasion, it might, we might do well to be reminded of the significance of our own baptism, to remember that, uh, and God's faithfulness in it. For some of us, you know, last week the sermon was about once upon a time. Well, for some of us, once upon a time, long, 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 long ago, you were baptized. 
And maybe you haven't thought about it, uh, reflected on it much. Recently, it's good for us to do so and to remember, to remember uh, the sign of his grace in it and in spite of our failures all along the way, morally and otherwise, that are contrary to his grace, that God remains rich in mercy and forgiveness. And so we ought to recommit ourselves to living by faith at this time as well. But as Robert and Hannah bring Lydia for baptism today, I will ask them a number of questions about their commitment to raising their child up in the faith. And then I'll ask you some questions about your commitment as a congregation as well. And so I'll ask these questions, uh, and if you answer in the affirmative, you can just say, we do, okay? So Hannah and Robert, or Robert and Hannah, I should probably say. Do you acknowledge Lydia's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you claim God's covenant promise, promises and benefits for Lydia, and by faith, do you look to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do your own? Do you? Do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God, and do you promise by relying on God's power and grace through the Holy Spirit to live an exemplary life before your child? Do you? Do you commit yourself to pray and for your child to teach your child the scriptures and the great articles of our faith in Jesus Christ? Do you? And do you promise to use every means provided by God, including faithful participation in the life of the church, to bring your child up in the loving discipline of the Lord? Do you? I have some, some questions for the congregation as well. I should have mentioned um, at the outset, uh, shame on me, I, as I say often, if it's not on my teleprompter here, it, it just doesn't, it goes right by me. But uh, Hannah um, and Harrison are children of this house, grew up uh, in this church, and um, I had the privilege of marrying Robert and Hannah a couple years ago, I guess it's been now, is that right? Almost two, almost two years. And so it's a special privilege for them to come back uh, for baptism today. They are currently living in the Chicago area, and so we see them from time to time, but not all the time. And so that fact informs just um, how we accept and live out our responsibility as the people of God, as a local congregation, but also just as the, the body of Christ more generally um, in supporting a family in the raising of their children. And so I'll ask you, do you, the members of this congregation, acting for yourselves and on behalf of the whole body of Christ, assume responsibility with these parents as with other children or uh, parents of young children, as you have opportunity, assume responsibility uh, with them for the spiritual nurture of this child, do you? And do you commit yourself to set a godly example before this child as you have opportunity to provide as far as you are able all that is necessary to the end that this precious little child Lydia may one day confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Do you? So I will ask for Robert and Hannah to bring uh, Lydia around here to this side of the baptismal font. And uh, we'll say a little prayer as we just ask God to bless this sacrament. Lord, we, we do thank you for this precious gift, not only of the child, not only the gift of faith in you, but this sacrament by which that uh, grace is symbolized as a sign and a seal. So we pray you would just set this apart from its ordinary uses and do something extraordinarily special in it today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so I will ask for her. Oh, okay. Is she going to switch? How's this going to go? I'm going to switch. 
sides here. All right. Is that better? Oh no. It's a precious sight. Wish you could see it. Well, Lydia Claire Tapio de Valle, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. And as I give her back to the more responsible party, <laughs> let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I pray for this precious family. I thank you for Robert and Hannah that you've brought them together in marriage and that you've given them the precious gift of this little child. And God, I pray that you would draw them uh, ever more closer to you um, individually and that in so doing, you would draw them closer together as a couple, that you would knit their hearts together and make them uh, uh, one in mind and heart and in spirit. God, I pray that just by your grace, because it is your intention to continue your covenant with man through families, Lord, I pray that you would claim Lydia as your very own all the days of her life, that there would never be a day where she did not know what it was to walk in your light and to know your favor. Would you bless them and keep them now all the days of their life, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, as we continue corporately together our time of worship, I want to read from uh, Psalm 95 as a call to worship. Then we'll pray and sing together. Psalm 95, 6 and 7, a familiar couple of verses says, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. He is our God, and we are his people. He accepts us as dear children as we come to him and worship. Let's begin our time with just a silent confession of our sins, casting our cares upon him and ready in our hearts to worship in spirit and in truth. Would you bow with me? Well, Lord, we do confess to you, to one another, and to the whole company of heaven that we have sinned through our own fault in thought and word and deed and by what we have left undone. We pray that by your grace today, as you have made provision through the sacrifice of Jesus, that you would apply to us the forgiveness secured for us through his death, and that you would cleanse us of all unrighteousness as you have promised to do. And Lord, we pray in so doing that we would be unhindered in our worship today, that we might know that we are free to come boldly before the throne of grace. Lord, I trust there are some uh, in great need of a demonstration of your grace today, of an assurance of it. And so, Lord, would you meet one by one as each has need today as we worship you. We cast our cares upon you. 
those distractions and burdens that might uh, in some way obstruct our worship, Lord. We lay at your feet today that you might be exalted and have all of our attention. So we invite you to do something special here today according to your will and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand and sing together. Good morning. Let's stand all over the building. Thank you. And let's turn around. Let's say good morning to our neighbors and we'll get right into worship.
Let's give him praise. Amen, church. What a wonderful God we serve. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Oh 
us once again. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. Just the voices. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Thank you, Lord. And let's all say the words of the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. to
Would you be seated for prayer? Lord, as the psalmist writes, for you alone, our soul waits in silence, for our hope is from you. You only are our rock and our salvation, our fortress. We shall not be shaken. On you, rests our salvation and our glory, our mighty rock, our refuge is you, Lord. And we praise you, God, because we know that you are steadfast and immovable. We know that you are the same and your years never come to an end. We know that you are seated in the heavens, and that you do whatsoever you please. You know the end from the beginning and work all things according to the counsel of your will. And so, Lord, you are a rock and a fortress, and our hope and trust is rightly and securely placed in you. And we come today acknowledging that we have need of that security that we find in you. As we carry any number of needs and burdens and we bring those to you, we thank you, Lord, that you prove yourself faithful to us over and over and over again, that you prove that your word is true and that you are true to your word. And so we know, Lord, that um, as we pray, According to your will, if we ask anything according to your will, the scripture says, we know that you hear us and we know that if you have heard, then we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of you. And so we bring to you, God, our needs today. I lift up to you those who are weary and heavy laden. I pray that in Jesus today and in the days to follow that they would find rest. I am sure there are some who are so weary they find it hard even to utter the praise that we sang about as being overflowing and Lord there are some who don't feel it overflowing who have to reach down deep to find it and say it anyway. God I pray that you would honor that as a sacrifice of praise and that you would fill them today with what they don't have naturally. A sense of joy, uh, a sense of peace, a sense of assurance that you see them, that you hear their cries for help, that you know exactly what it is that they need even better than they do, and that you meet them right there. Father, I pray for the list of those among us who are sick, who are facing other medical trials of one sort or another. Lord, I pray for healing. I pray for comfort. I pray, Lord, for strength for those who need it to be raised back up to do the things that life calls them to do, requires of them, and the things that they want to do. Lord, I pray that you would give them the vitality to live life fully and that even as they wait for that day to return, that they would find you to be present, that they would find your grace to be sufficient, that they'd find your strength to be made perfect in weakness. Once again, we do rejoice with those who rejoice and are just praising and finding it easy to praise today. We weep with those who weep. We walk along with one another um, at every point of need and in every kind of need. 
And we pray that your grace would be demonstrated through us toward one another. Lord, so everything that we would give voice to if we were praying individually, right now we just, in our hearts, roll those burdens over onto you. Pray that you would work them all together for our good because of your great love for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Ephesians chapter 2. Hopefully you turned there when I told you to. (laughs) Uh, The words will be on the screen otherwise, but we're continuing this series through Ephesians 2. And because of the way our service is structured uh, today with just this extraordinary privilege of uh, uh, administering both the sacrament of baptism and communion in the same service, I've uh, shortened this message at least in the way that I've planned it. I can never promise it is shorter in the way that it comes out, but what I've, what I've planned and written down uh, is intended to be a little bit more concise for that reason. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we'll read all of that, and then my message will come just from verses 8 through 10, as we did the first part of that last week. I'm going to ask you if you're able to stand in honor of the reading of God's word as we listen attentively to his voice in it and acknowledge his authority as he speaks. Listen to the word of the Lord. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Well, Father, we do thank you for your word. We open it now, as always, with the expectation that you have something to say to us in it, not just by way of passing along information, but because it is true and living and powerful and able to pierce to the very center of our being, discerning the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. We pray that you would do so, that you would open our ears to hear, our hearts to understand, Uh, that you would bend our will in the direction of yours for us, that we might respond wholeheartedly to what you say to us, that we might be grateful, that we might be obedient, that we might rejoice always in the goodness of our great God. And so I ask that you would speak, O Lord, your word, by your spirit, through your servant, to your people, for your glory. We know it's for our good, and so would you move me out of the way and use my voice as your instrument today. For Christ's sake, amen. You may be seated. Well, a number of years ago, um, a former college classmate of mine had an art studio in Atlanta. Uh, At one point, he was actually featured on the local news in Atlanta. He was... uh, Uh, making somewhat of a uh, splash, I guess, in at least however much of a splash one makes in the art scene. But anyway, enough of a splash. He got some acknowledgement on the local Atlanta news, specifically for his artwork that was created using recycled materials, recycled building materials to be specific. There were a couple of old neighborhoods there where the houses had been built around the turn of the 20th century. They were originally 
beautiful homes. Many of them, though, over a century of use, had fallen into disrepair to one degree or another. Some of those houses were undergoing major renovations. Uh, Others were being torn down. But maybe you can imagine thinking about houses built around the turn of the 20th century. You, maybe some of you, even uh, a handful of you, may live in such a house, uh, but many of you have seen some like that. Maybe you can imagine some of the beautiful wood that would be thrown out as a part of a renovation project like that. Uh, think of those beadboard walls and the trim work, hardwood floors. Don't you dare tear those up. Even the hardware on the doors, right? Uh, Even the um, electrical wires and outlets and some of the the plumbing and the, the quality of materials that was there and the uniqueness of it in the sense that you don't find it of exactly that sort or of that quality anymore. All of that being thrown out as a part of this renovation these renovation projects. So this artist would spend hours at a time digging through dumpsters to find materials. And he would choose the ones that interested him, not because he knew what he was going to do with them uh, ahead of time necessarily, but he chose the ones that were of interest to him and he would fashion those recycled materials into beautiful works of art. And some of them were just truly stunning. There are lots of artists around that do that kind of work, uh, art out of even literally trash. I've seen some that's, you know, they make artwork out of trash that's washed up in the beach, uh, other garbage of other sorts, recycled materials of one sort or another. But there was something fitting, I thought, and especially helpful in this example um, that I mentioned as an illustration of one aspect of God's work of new creation. You'll remember, just in our series at the beginning of the year, that in the beginning, the creation of man and woman was God's crowning act of creation. Humans were made in His image, so that their very presence on the earth and their activity on the earth would reveal God's glory. His his image was to be reflected in humans on the earth. But then through sin, God's good creation fell into disrepair, including his good creation of human beings. And man was left spiritually dead, and impaired in every other way, emotionally, physically, intellectually, uh, in every way, we were left impaired by that fall. But out of that brokenness, God chose some parts and pieces that he used to fashion A new creation, namely fashioning us into part of his new creation. The master craftsman, the master artist, the master uh, artisan who's fashioned us as his handiwork. And so I just want to look quickly um, today at these three verses at his handiwork in us which he has made by grace, through faith, and for good works. It's a simple and uncreative outline that follows the text about as directly as I possibly could. And again, I'll hit them quickly, but it says here first that we were saved from the rubble, as it were, by grace. Last week, uh, as as we... unpacked the first several verses, um, the first seven verses specifically of what we just read together. You'll remember that once upon a time, we were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, he said. We were enemies of God once upon a time. 
We don't think of ourselves as being that way, but that's what he says we were. Following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. Walking along with the sons of disobedience, we were just like every other sinner, every other sinner. Even the kind who really gets you stirred up from time to time now. And maybe would incline you to think you're, yeah, you know, you're a sinner and you were a sinner, but not quite like that kind of sinner. No, he says, just like the rest of mankind. Once upon a time, that was you and me. But once upon a time, God raised us up. Remember the best but in the Bible. But God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive when we were dead in trespasses and sins. There was nothing, nothing that we contributed to that. We didn't wink. We didn't signal somehow that we uh, had a desire to no longer be his enemy. We did nothing to suggest our worthiness for it. We didn't merit it, in other, in other words. Redemption or forgiveness in any way. It was entirely by grace. We use the word grace all the time uh, in Christian circles, especially evangelical circles. But I think we don't fully get our heads and our hearts around just how amazing it is. That it's better than the story of when the, uh, you know, the, 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 the helicopter or the plane sort of swoops in and rescues somebody out of the war zone. And those are great stories too, right? The, heli the helicopter lands, the, the, the soldiers come and get on board and they fly out and they're looking down at this battlefield, thankful for sure that they have just been, uh, just been rescued by the goodness of somebody else. This story is, is far better because God swoops in and saves some of the enemy. What a crazy story. You couldn't sell that story in Hollywood, right? Oh, it defies all the sense of justice we have, although he will surely be, he will show himself to be uh, completely just as well. Perfect in justice, but, but perfect in grace and mercy. He saved us, made us his own, made us his handiwork by grace. He did it, number two, through faith, it says. In fact, it says, as you read on in, in verses 8 and 9, if you look there, even your faith is not your own doing. You see that? For it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Pardon me, I'm, I'm quoting the the New King James Version instead of the ESV again. That's how I remember it. And some of you learned it in the King James, and that's probably what's going on in your head as well. Lest any man should boast. But even our faith is not of our own doing. You, you, can't, even, you can't even boast, in other words, what makes you a Christian and some people not a Christian. Oh, well, I just had the good sense at least to believe good news when I heard it. Or I had the good sense to accept it when it was offered. no. Uh, you had the good grace of God who lavished it upon you and gave even the gift to believe. It's extraordinary. It's mind-boggling. It, it, it probably doesn't entirely fit in your brain right now. I hope there's somebody who's going, I'm not sure I can get my head around that because it's really that extraordinarily good. That even our faith is a gift, so that no man may boast. Listen, the, the, I've said before, the, the greatest oxymoron, I would say, in all of creation. Do you know what an oxymoron is? You know, it's a sort of paradox, a contradiction in terms. But, but a, the greatest oxymoron I know of is a boastful Christian. It doesn't mean there's any shortage of boastful Christians, mind you. But it doesn't make any sense for a Christian to boast if the Christian understands how he became a Christian, totally by the grace of God. 
there's nothing to boast in. Anytime, this is one of the, this is one of the good temperature checks on our own spiritual life and our own heart. Anytime I feel inclined to feel boastful about my, uh, by faith, my existence as a, as a believer, anything that would, would make me feel superior in any way spiritually to anybody else and particularly to anybody who's not a Christian. Anytime I am so inclined, uh, we've lost sight of grace. We have lost sight of grace. Um, he's, he's saved us by grace through faith, which itself is a gift, so that no one can boast. And what do you do instead of boasting? You give him all the praise. All the praise. I mean, at times it ought to just make us giggle with giddiness how good God has been to us. I may have said that last week. But it ought to just make you grin some time when you stop and think. I know me. I know the me I used to be. And neither one of them was really worthy of his favor. Not the one I used to be. Not even the one I am now. But he gave it to me anyway. By grace, through faith, and then for good works. You know, we looked last week at the fact that he said uh, in verse 7, all that he had, you know, we were dead in our trespasses, enemies of God, just like every other sinner, but God who's rich in mercy raised us up so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He intends for all of this to exalt him. That people, even more then than now, will see how extraordinarily good he is and how great he is. So that all the glory will be pointed there. But our good works are supposed to do that even in the here and now. Verse 10 says, at the, at the conclusion of this passage, many of you memorized uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, probably at some point along the way in your childhood. Sunday school, uh, you know, some kids more recently, Awana, or whatever, wherever it was that you memorized Bible verses, you might have memorized those two. But then verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This word workmanship, the Greek word is poema. It's the word from which we get the word poem. But it refers generally just to the product of one's work. What is produced by work is poema. Something produced or created, including the work of an artist or an artisan, but certainly not limited to that. Like we think of, we, we refer to works of art, right? We refer to works of music. Uh, in fact, um, opus, a magnum opus or monum opus is a great work. This refer, many uh, works of music are referred to by that term. One Bible translation actually says in verse 10, you are God's masterpiece. I wrote in a newsletter article a really short entry about that this week, thinking about what is it that makes a masterpiece a masterpiece? And of course, it's extraordinary and it's uh, enduringly good. We might also add to that uh, the obvious that it was made by a master. <laughs> That somebody, even probably before they created what was their masterpiece, has already been uh, come to be acknowledged as a real master of uh, the art or music or whatever it is that they produce. But that word here, uh, it, it, the word itself, poema, doesn't necessarily mean masterpiece, but it could rightly be said of anything that God created, right? Anything that God created is a masterpiece. 
But we could say that uh, unquestionably about his creation of humanity, even in the beginning, and his new creation of redeemed humanity, and that's what he's speaking of here. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand so that you should walk in them. Do you see all the way up to almost all the way through 10 verses, it's all about what God has done. And our response is to walk in the good works for which he has created us and the good works which he has prepared for us. We often have a challenge as evangelicals to decide where good works fit into our thinking. We're so averse to them because we're afraid of uh, any be, anybody slipping into believing that we're saved by works, that we do away with works altogether. No, he says we are created for good works. He's prepared them so that we should walk in them. So that for us and everyone looking on, our redeemed lives ought to declare the goodness and the glory of God. You see, that the way you live your life and I live mine imitating Jesus in the way of love, kindness, forgiveness, and so on, that life of good works ought to declare the, the goodness and the glory of God. I thought of it, again, as works of his new creation made from what used to be, what were originally uh, these beautiful constructions, right? Like these turn of the century, turn of the 20th century homes originally beautiful but fallen into disrepair, that we in the same way fashioned into new creations. It's sort of like Psalm 19, verses 1 through 3. Some of you have heard those, don't necessarily know that's the reference, but it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Do you remember that? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Creation sings of the glory of God. In fact, Romans 1 comes around to say that from the beginning of creation, his invisible attributes have, made, have been made clearly known to mankind. He has revealed himself to all humanity such that Men are without excuse for worshiping him. You can go back and read that passage beginning in verse 18 if you wish. But the point is, um, his creation declares his glory. And declares it loudly enough that it says he deserves to be praised. And so, as his new creation, our newly created lives characterized by good works, ought to declare the glory of God. That's the implication here of the conclusion of this passage, that all that he has done, lavishing his grace upon us, ought to produce in us a life so transformed from what it used to be and so different from what other lives are that he is glorified by the testimony that our, that our very lives are, and not by simply what we say. And how might we do that? Well, um, again, I actually, he'll answer that question. He's leading, he's leading here in Ephesians. He'll begin telling us in chapter 4, how then shall we live in light of all this grace that's been lavished upon us? But if we connect the dots uh, ahead of time, we might think about, again, what Jesus himself modeled, what Jesus told us to model, that we might not be characterized by anger, wrath, and malice, 
that we might be characterized by compassion and kindness and forgiveness, patience, forbearance with other people, loving even our enemy, turning the other cheek, not repaying evil for evil. See, I'm not making anything up, Anna, am I? But you know, and I know, the challenge of actually taking him seriously on some of those things. Actually loving our enemy. Actually turning the other cheek, even in a figurative sense, not retaliating. I mean, it's simple, but it's not easy. In other words, he just states it very simply. But there's any number of ways. The point is, that sort of life is so extraordinary in all of the history of humanity. It turns life upside down the way every uh, non-Christian culture is inclined to live it. The way natural man, I should say, is just inclined to live it. Certainly turns it upside down in contrast to the way the first century Greco-Roman world was inclined to live it. But that we might be so kind, so compassionate, so pure in the way that we live. That it's extraordinary, extraordinary, strikingly good in in the works we do, particularly toward others, that God may be praised, that his new creation in me might declare the glory of God. He has done good things for us beyond measure so that that immeasurable goodness and his kindness toward in Christ Jesus might give him praise throughout eternity. You are his handiwork. You are the product of his craftsmanship. If you're you're a follower of Jesus, you have been fashioned by him into something new that is a masterpiece designed for good works that bring him glory. The question is, how will you and I respond to the knowledge of that truth today and in the weeks and months and years to come? Let's pray together as we conclude. Well, God, your grace is amazing. And we thank you, Lord, that we are what we are by grace, through faith that is a gift, and for good works that you have prepared. And Lord, I pray that you would give us new perspective to be able to see ourselves as new creations, created for good works, but for your glory. And God, I pray that you would stir up in us a fresh new delight in living that way. That you might even now be exalted in our lives, in our hearts as more glorious than others around us have known because of your kindness and your goodness toward us. Lord, would you work in our hearts by your spirit to do just that. In Christ's name, amen. Well, we're going to come to the communion table where, again, we get to partake of uh, in a tangible way and in a visible way that gift of his sacrifice for us of what it cost for him to demonstrate his grace to us. As uh, some have said, grace is free, but it isn't cheap. 
It was secured for us and given to us at the price of the life of the Son of God. And so when we come to the Lord's Supper, we actually participate in that death with him, that we're joined with him uh, through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I'll, I'll mention a couple of things at the outset. We are today coming forward for communion. We do this from time to time. For those who are new here or visiting, um, you may want to just, well, I was going to say you might want to list, listen carefully or just follow the person in front of you. It's actually <laughs> that easy. But the table is open to all those who are truly believers in Jesus Christ. If you've placed your faith in Jesus uh, and, and have committed your life to following him, you are welcome at his table. You don't have to be a member of this church. But we'll come forward and uh, partake of the elements here at the front. And so we'll actually, in a moment, begin up in the balcony. And the balcony will come down first. And then as they've made their way uh, forward, we'll go from back to front. So those in the back row can just see when, when they've all, when that crowd kind of thins out there. And they can fall in, in line on both sides and come down front. There are tables at either side, which you can come and partake of. Um, there are some communion, uh, some gluten-free cubes of bread. So there's a kind of traditional unleavened communion wafers uh, in the tray as well, but also some gluten-free bread for those who maybe need that. If you are unable to come forward, then you just remain in your seat. We'll have somebody milling about looking, so if you'll just remain seated and then indicate um, by just a, a show of hands that, um, that you would like to have uh, the elements served to you there in your seat. As I said, we'll come forward Receive the elements here, and we'll partake of them right down front before you return to your seat, both the bread and the cup. Um, if you would wish, you can do that as a couple or as a family unit. You can receive the elements and step to the side, pray together, and partake together as you would, uh, as you would wish. And then um, at the conclusion, we'll have some of our elders and ministry leaders available for prayer. But having said all of that, we're reminded that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, let's pray together before we partake together. Well, Lord, we do thank you for the indescribably, immeasurably good gift of your grace toward us. We thank you that it was offered at the cost of the life of the Son of God. And so God, we receive it as an extraordinary gift. And with some desire to understand how extraordinary is your grace. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bless this ordinary bread and juice, consecrate them, set them apart for this extraordinary purpose, that by partaking of them, we might really receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ in a spiritual and mysterious sense, in a way beyond our understanding. But we pray that you would do something real and powerful here to bring us into communion with the living, risen Lord Jesus Christ and minister to us as we do in his name. Amen. Well, I ask our uh, elders to go ahead and come forward.
And then we'll begin uh, with the balcony. If you'll go ahead and um, sort of file down and make your way down forward here. And um, you can come right down to either side and receive the elements here.
was grace. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace stand and let's together sing praise God.
And amen, amen. Would you receive today's benediction and then remain standing for the singing of the doxology as we dismiss. And now may God continue to give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of his power toward you as one who believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Raise you far, raise you sun.